Under the night bright starlight we will fade away Under the night bright starlight Under the night bright starlight Recorded live from the engine room at Broad Ripple, this is the Voices of Indie live stream hosted by Josh Gillespie. Voices of Indie is a show dedicated to giving you the opportunity to know the musical, visual, and theatrical arts of Indianapolis, Indiana. This week's guest is one of the most talented musicians I have come across here in Indianapolis. I had the pleasure of doing a show with him a, a few months back, and so please welcome musician, local musician, Paul Holland. But before we get to Paul, I want to talk today about today's uh, sponsor, which is Indianapolis Independent Entertainment. IIE LLC's goal is to help grow local DIY artists, freelancers, and businesses within Indianapolis and generate more paying creative opportunities. Their mission is simple, to establish a network of creatives who excel in areas of need and connecting them with other network members. This way they can help to expand the local art and music scenes. IIE believes that by eliminating some of the intimidating barriers within the entertainment industry, more opportunities will be produced for local freelancers and businesses. This will help Indianapolis become the place to go for art and music in the Midwest. If you are interested in learning more, go to their website, indieindient.com. That's I-N-D-Y-I-N-D-I-E-E-N-T dot com. And fill out a free application to discuss how you and IIE can redefine making it together. And I am pleased to say that my guest is also a fellow IIE me uh, member, Mr. Paul Holland. Paul, thank you for being on the show this week. I'm, I'm excited to have you on. We've been working on this for a little while, haven't we? Uh, I'd say, what? Three months, three three months, something like that. It's it's been a, it's been a bit to try to get you in here, uh, and not on your end. It's been on my end. I've had a I've had a full schedule. Well, you're a busy uh, guy. Well, I'm just thrilled to be able to finally have you on, and um, and I, I wasn't lying when I said that you're probably one of the most talented musicians that I've come across here in Indianapolis. Thanks, man. It means um, a lot. Paul and I did a gig together back in September, I believe it was the Acoustic Sounds of Indianapolis at Provider Coffee Shop, and that was the first time that I had heard Paul or met Paul. And um, it was just it it was it was a solid evening, and I left that evening kind of stunned by what I heard. So thank you for being a part of that. <laughs> I don't know what to say to that. <laughs> I'll say this: you do anything long enough, you should be decent at it. You know? Yeah. No. Exactly. Exactly. <clears throat> so for those who may not know you, and I have a feeling that's probably going to be a lot of people who may be listening to this, they don't know who Paul Holland is, um, and your music isn't exactly out there quite yet, although I do believe that you have some stuff from some from a previous act um, out on Spotify. But tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're from, um, and what, what got you into music, and what got you to Indianapolis. All right. Um, let's see here. What's What was the first question? <laughs> well, tell me just a little bit about yourself. All right. Well, I mean, it's a big story. That's it's a okay. Lot, we got time. A man. lot of parts to it. We got time. Let's just let me start with how I got into music. So I've been playing for probably uh, as odd as this sounds, thirty years now. I started, wow. yeah, I started really young. <clears throat> so I think it was around first grade, actually. Uh, I lived out in the middle of nowhere in uh, Illinois in a farmhouse, and my dad uh, was a picker, still is, and he would play sitting on the bed. So I would crawl, I'd, it was like a whole like Mission Impossible thing, like I'd sneak <laughs> in the room and crawl under the bed and uh, listen to him play. And then sometimes I'd take a walkie-talkie with me, and then I'd air it to my sister who was in the other room. Oh, that's so cool. <clears throat> yeah. So I, I grew up, uh, I grew up, I was very, very fortunate. Um, the, the back, or the uh, dictionary of music that he had, the catalogs of uh, music that he had, was... Not your typical thing, I think, to listen to. So I grew up with just some really uh, unique artists, and uh, I think I was kind of blessed a little bit because I, I've I've become a adamant fan of listening to music. You know, you ask somebody like, "What do you listen to?" and they say everything. The first thing when somebody says it to me, I'm like, "All right, polka," and they're like, so they start laughing. Yeah. And it's like, well, you know, like when I say everything, I mean everything. Uh, some of my favorite groups are not at all what people would ever, I think, think I would listen to. Really? Like who? Well, large question. Uh, one of the groups I listen to a lot that I don't, and that's the thing, I, I love music so much. I love listening to so many uh, different artists that 
but they're not at all what I will emulate or try to sound like. But one of my favorites is uh, this Greek band. They're called Aphrodite's Child, and they, uh, I've got, I think, every album by now easily. But they had uh, one of the first concept albums, and I think it was like 1972. Really? So we had, you know, Pink Floyd and all this cool stuff. You yeah. Know, you had the Dark Side of the Moon, all these different concept albums over here. But they were this Greek band, and it was so, like, off the wall crazy. There was, I feel like they were just way ahead of their time. Because you would have, like, almost like Greek uh, opera music going on. And then it was, uh, man, I don't even know how to explain it. The one of the albums I always loved is called Six Six Six. It was a double album, mm -hmm. and I think it went through like, I think it went through like the whole story of like the Book of Revelations. I'm not oh wow super uh, versed in that, but I think that's what it was. And I think their big hit was called The Four Horsemen. That would make sense if it's coming from the Book of Revelation, <laughs> dude. So wild story here. No, this is how this works because I'm just gonna talk and talk and talk. I love it. Just, let's do <clears> it, man. Let's dive right in. I think it was freshman year when I was in high school. We had a really cool uh, civics teacher, and he had a music question like calendar on his desk, right? Yeah. So it was like, what Greek psychedelic band had the no hit, The way. Four Horsemen? So I, and instantly I'm like, you know, hey, that's Aphrodite's Child. And he starts laughing. He's like, well, you looked at it when you came in. I was like, actually, I said, I got the CD in my locker. I was like, I listened to you on the way to school. <laughs> and he's like, no, there's no chance. So he's like, go get it. And I did. And he just stood there. He goes, man, he goes, you're such a weird kid. <laughs> But so I don't know, man. Uh, I really do. Just I love so many different styles of music, mm -hmm. and I think that's helped me um, massively with coming up with my own style because mm -hmm. I'm putting together so many things I've heard, just melody wise and stuff like that, and it kind of blends into what comes out of me. Who would you say have been your <clears throat> biggest influences? I mean, you, you seem to have a giant pool to sure. pull from. So, but who who would who would uh... Who's influenced you the most? The best uh, response, I, I have to put a disclaimer on it. That's fine. <clears throat> Excuse me. Disclaimer is um, confidence and arrogance shake a very similar hand. Interesting. Okay, I like that. And the reason I say that mm -hmm. is because I get this question a lot from people, and uh, they say, who's your influence? I said, my influence is myself. Mm -hmm. I listen to myself uh, based off of, Everything from daily interactions to people, from memories, good and bad, everything in between, uh, all the places I've been. Um, it's it's kind of like the soundtrack to my life. Mm -hmm. I don't sit around and emulate other players is the real truth. Um, you know, I do play a lot of electric guitar. I grew up playing blues and stuff very heavily. I work with uh, one of my heroes, a blues artist. So in that realm, he's worn off a little bit. But I never really sat around and studied him. I think that's sure. why he lets me play with him, because anybody should be on that stage. It shouldn't be me. There's so many people mm -hmm. so far more deserving. But I think we're coming from a similar place sometimes internally. <clears throat> so those things, his expression, I notice myself having a similar expression sometimes. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, I don't have a better answer, unfortunately. I listen to a lot of people I love. But sure. Um, I just don't, unless it's a cover I'm trying to learn. And when I do that, I don't, uh, I don't really play it ever. Like they write it. I'll well, rewrite it completely. I have to be honest. If you're going to be doing a cover, you want to put your own stamp on 100%. it. A hundred percent. You want to put your own stamp on it. And now so just I tell the rest that. of the city that and all the <laughs> patrons and <laughs> it's like, wait, you didn't play it. No, I mean, I won't, I won't dog on anybody. Nah, that's. Uh, no, I, I get it. I get it. Um, no, that's that's kind of fascinating to kind of know that, you know, you, the, the way that you pull from the background, from your background, the way that you pull from your history, and uh, you allow that to influence your output, your yeah. musical output. I'll get something from this tonight. And that's, that's the real fun thing about uh, kind of how you brought up, like people don't know you and stuff like that. I think I'm the chameleon. I've been called a chameleon a lot because everybody said, well, you blend in. But I don't think I have a face that's memorable or something because everybody's like, well, I think I've heard of you. Mm -hmm. And then I'll play and I'll I'll get a, I get really unique compliments, which mean a lot to me. But they're always, they're always interesting. Mm -hmm. Like you'll freeze somebody or something, you know, something unusual or you, you'll make somebody cry and then they'll come up and tell you what part of that song touched them. And that, man, that's just... That's better than a paycheck to me, in mm -hmm. all honesty. 
I'll never quit doing this. But those are the reasons that just compound it and reinforce it over and over and over. Mm -hmm. But even like this moment here, I mean, this isn't what I typically do on a, what is today? Tuesday? Yeah, it's a Tuesday. Yeah, you know, I'm not, it's not every Tuesday. I'm just hanging out in a cool studio. Yeah. <clears throat> so, <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it all rolls into songs one way or another. And I think that's how it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. At least that's the way I like it. So, well, um, go into a little bit about, you know, how you've been working on. You said uh, before we started that you were working on some songs. You know, you're getting ready to start recording here soon, mm -hmm. um, so that so that people can finally hear Paul Holland. Sure. Um, what is it that you've been working on recently that uh, we can look forward to digesting musically as we we get to experience what it's like to hear you play? Well, I'll start off by saying I'm always recording, and I have been. Um, when I say always, I mean, uh, even if it's not at home, it's on a almost a daily basis still, even at this point in my life. There are some parts where it was <clears throat> almost obsessive. So if I did a 12-hour shift, 11 hours a night for six months was writing, and I found all these shortcuts of how to expand on that and uh, pretty much go to work and get a paycheck and be writing the whole time. And I've specifically chosen jobs my whole life for that reason. Mm -hmm. So, like an example, it's kind of like the John Prine example as a mailman. I wrote so much and I was a mailman, it was crazy. Um, I wrote an album's worth of stuff, I think, in three months. Um, uh, it's probably even a lot shorter than that. Maybe like two, maybe a month and a half, two months um, when I was at the post office another time. So, I always try to find those jobs where mm -hmm. you can just kind of cheat a little bit the whole system you know it's like well i'm here you know and i'm doing my thing but but i'm kind of not here i'm kind of completely somewhere else mm -hmm. and uh um anyways so if i scrolled through my phone right now you'd see just it would do this and it'd just keep going and going and going and going yeah. going. the problem is you get so much material it's like there's just not enough time you'd need 89 hours in a day to even get close to a starting point but on that note, yeah, I've been uh, recording and evolving with recording for years. And actually, it's probably um, two decades now. now. You're actually kind of trained in this, aren't you? I am, yep. Tell me a little bit about the, the training that you've done uh, and what got you into the recording process in general. Um, so for audio engineering, I started, I bought my uh, first... I think it was a 16 track Fostex unit. And I started with that. I was in the military at the time. I was in the Air Force. And I remember it showed up and I was like, oh, this, I'm just going to plug this bitch in and I'm going <laughs> to, you know, instantly <laughs> it's everything's going to sound perfect. And boy, <laughs> <laughs> not quite. Not 20 years later. And it's like, does this, e does this adjustment sound right? You know, um, I started just tinkering and i think within like five years it was like all right let's get some monitors let's get some mics and then started the beautiful down the internet rabbit hole that never ended until i ended it which it's completely ended now and i actually made myself um my own books i wrote them start to finish really yeah i'll hand them out to like really close friends uh -huh. but i want a manual a no bullshit manual where you never had to hear an opinion you know, if you just start with a simple thing, like where should my levels be? Mm -hmm. You'll like three weeks later after reading every night, you still don't know where to put it. You know, yeah, and it's like, yeah. not, I'm not doing this. It's like, here's your range. This is where you should be. But I think the first thing in the book is like label your track. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a, it's a manual instead of a book. It'd be a step-by-step -step manual start to finish. And I spent probably a year working on that. And I'm still working on a mastering one right now. Oh, really? Yeah, I think I'm like halfway uh, through putting stuff together for it. So do you find yourself to be more self-taught, or have you actually gone through classes to do some of this? Yeah, stuff? so I was self-taught, uh, and then that spread into other people that were doing it and mm -hmm. just constantly picking their brain. And then it spread into, well, let's take some classes. So I took, I think I did six years total at uh, Berkeley. Oh, wow. For audio engineering, mixing, mastering. But there was other stuff in there, too, a lot of other stuff, man. Um just different courses, and I think I, I listened to a, um, I think it was Andrew Sheps, I was watching something on him yesterday, 
And he said, this is why I always recommend schooling, because it gives you some direction and discipline. And I can definitely say that. Sorry, Berkeley, but like, I, all, after all that, I, you know, they're not, they taught you great stuff and they gave you a, a work, you know, workload and uh, step by step how to do this and that. But I noticed I was, I noticed I was beyond, I think, a little bit of like my classmates when we started talking about gear and stuff like that. And I was like, okay, you know, I guess I do know what I'm doing. And I mean, I, I think I've got a hundred and, probably 50 or somewhere in there, a thousand invested in wow. my stuff now. So that's a pretty impressive setup then you must have. <sighs> Boy, poverty is a hell of a motivator, <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. A lot of overtime, a lot of hustling. Everything's been a hustle here and there and odd jobs, pickup jobs. And then uh, a lot of trading and trading up and a lot mm -hmm. of repair and stuff like that. Yeah. I'm kind of a full stop uh, shop at this point. That's definitely something I'd love to talk about because if anyone listens to this, um, that feels like they're in that situation. Um, it might be kind of nice to have somebody to relate to. You sure. Know? No, absolutely. Especially absolutely. in the do-it-yourself age, you know? No, exactly. Exactly. Well, uh, we're in, into a bit of a groove here, but I kind of want to hear you play, if that's okay. All right. We can make that happen. All right. So... Um... Paul, what would you say is going to be the first song that you're going to play for us tonight? Well, this is, I love playing this song. Uh, it's called Edge, uh, Edge of the City. Okay. And, uh, yeah, man, it's just put together um, out of just a story. Actually, it's put together out of a very vivid uh, image that I have of uh, helping a friend get through something. And it was, so when I was at, living out in Boulder, you could drive up and kind of get some elevation. I remember we looked out over it and just saw all of the uh, lights and everything. And so that moment created this song for me, yeah. years and years later. Beautiful. And uh, the name it comes off of, because it's got a, a lyric in there, but the name came from a song called Keys to the City uh, from a band in Omaha. And I loved the song. And I think I reached out to the kid like, 15 years later, I said, whatever happened to that song? He's like, I cannot believe you. Like, I don't know who you are. And how, you know, I'm like, it's a great song. Sure. But anyways, here we go. Forget our whole plan Cause I want to take you to the edge of the city I know a place we can stand Where I can show you all those things you think are pretty And we'll share our words I will tell you one of my favorite stories And we'll lose our way Till the night time is ablaze by the morning Gotta listen up So take care of our memories So they don't vanish with all their end meaning and I'm along to a melody well let it leave you with a soul full feeling well I remember that day got caught in the downpour laughing underneath the rain well believe me when I say all the best memories stay with you always When I hear those words But just come here, get closer And your hands touch my face As I'm kissing your shoulders We are everything at once 
Like an instant explosion Well, if I have to find you every life again Well, I do it over and over All over and over All over and over and all over and over. Under the night bright starlight we will fade away under the night bright starlight under the night bright starlight we will fade away under the night bright starlight well, under the night bright starlight we will fade away under the night bright starlight well, under the night bright starlight we will fade away under the night bright starlight Well, under the night bright starlight We will fade away Under the night bright starlight Yeah, under the night bright starlight We will fade away Under the night bright starlight Under the night bright starlight We will fade away Under the night bright starlight Mm. Under the night bright starlight we will fade away Under the night bright starlight Wow, that was amazing. Well, thanks, man. That was that was pure joy in in my <laughs> opinion hear, hearing that. And I I re remembered that song from when you had played that at at the Acoustic Sounds of Indie show. Yeah. So I was excited to hear when you were practicing that beforehand. I was like, oh, I like that one. I'm happy that you're playing that Somebody one. Somebody one time told me the ending was boring and repetitive nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, well, thanks for coming out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so tell me a little bit about some of your, your interesting uh, playing experiences. What would you say has been... Because you, you had quite the, the story uh, that I remember... Um, that you told uh, about dealing with people who were trying to talk loud over you. Um, oh boy! But which uh, one? <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say, what? Is, give me an example of you know probably one of your best experiences and one of your worst experiences playing out. Sure. Well, I mean, boy, <laughs> there's some doozies. Um, I'll well, tell when, you when you've been playing as long as you have. I'll tell you one recently. Um, I pulled a line. There's this guy that was in Denver. His name was Lenny Trinilla. And this is what always cracks me up because it, I mean, Lenny's passed away, you know, but I always wondered like, do any of these people ever remember me? Cause I remember everybody mm -hmm. and I remember deeply what they say, but Lenny was like a beat poet that ran with the real beats, man. And, uh, so when I saw Lenny, he had to be in his like late seventies or something. So he's okay. this old man in the corner, you know, the hat on and just. <clears throat> but he uh, he listened to everybody so intently, and uh, everybody kind of st stayed away. From, I think we were like scared of him, you know. Mm -hmm. But I remember one time, he's I, I played, and he he goes, "Come here," and he sat down. And he goes, "Every time you take the stage, it's like lightning hits you." I'll wow. never forget that. Um, it was the best compliment ever because he was a wordsmith, a hundred percent lived as a wordsmith. But yeah, anyways, I stole a line from him. So he'd go up to the stage, you think this old man's going to come up there and it's going to be some calm pose. He'd start off, he'd be like, this ain't a Starbucks, motherfuckers. Like, instantly, <laughs> grab the whole room's attention, he's a master. But uh, I had this lady recently, and it was like that. She, uh, we were playing, uh, or I was playing, and I can't remember, I think she said, uh, play something good. So, of course, I'm like, well, you know, I'm trying to. Yeah. But I said, it's real hard when you're just sitting in the corner, yelling at me <laughs> you know <laughs> so i was like i said where are you i said put your hand up i said i'm not playing me i said show me who you are mm -hmm. so she stuck her hand up i was like what is fucking wrong with you <laughs> i was like the <laughs> bad day i said what is this like i'm up here trying to do my thing and she goes just turn the jukebox on 
And I was like, ma'am, I said, this ain't a Starbucks. <laughs> you know, I was like, I said, go to Target, go somewhere else. I said, this is real. You're in a r- room with live music, real people. Mm-hmm. You know, I wanted to tear that jukebox off the wall and just throw it out. And she, wow. fu- I think, actually, I mean, it's a weird scenario because I don't typically, like, I was yelling and stuff. I don't typically call out people that hard. I'm definitely being calm about it now. But, sure. I mean, I exploded like that. And she's like, well, all right, you know, I'm, I just want to listen. And it calmed her down. I think that's just her personality. Like, she needed somebody to fire back and uh, make the whole... It's When you got a microphone, you're so powerful. Mm-hmm. Not everybody has one in the room. So when you're exactly. talking, it's like... But I love opening the floor up to anything, um, negative criticism. I, I don't typically fight back with people, but I'll try to stop them to make them think. Mm-hmm. And it typically, typically goes there, you know. Why do you want to hear the jukebox? We got real people in a real room in this moment right here. Yeah. It's like, can we just be here for a second? And then when we go to the store, you can be in music land and stuff like that. Yeah. I don't think, I think there's a lot of people that are walking around asleep. And as an artist on a stage, it's the only title I'll claim too, as an artist, I think that's your point is to wake somebody up. Mm-hmm. Um, once again, if I wasn't getting a paycheck, that'd be the big motivator. I mean, sure. the paycheck's fine, but the real reason you're there is to try to shake somebody. Mm-hmm. I have one that was pretty wild. Um, right when I moved here, I played at a coffee shop, and there was this guy that kept interrupting over and over and over. And I learned a lesson from him because I didn't put the time into him I should have. I think I was a little snarky. Hmm. And uh, it taught that moment taught me a lot, and I've held it with me ever since. But he said, he kept saying, well, you know, you should be on American Idol, all this silly stuff, right? And then next thing you know, he's crying and he's saying, I'm not going to be here in 72 hours anymore. And he said, I want to empty my bank account to you. I'm not going to need it. And looking back now, I wish I would have handled that like more maturely. I'm not saying I did a terrible job, but. Well, I, when you get into that kind of situation, how would anybody respond? I, I think mean, I would ex- respond a little different next time. Um, man, I have so many stories turning through my head of, like, these moments. I have mm-hmm. to tell you some of these. So, anyways, long story short with him, he, uh, when somebody says something like that, you don't take them serious. You know, like, yeah, no, yeah. I mean, you take the the traumatic thing serious. Yes. But not like, I'm going to empty my bank account to you. It's like, dude, I don't, I don't want your money. And I yeah. think that's why I told him. I was like, I'm fine. Thank you. Good compliment. But I remember asking him, like, what's going on? And it just opened up a big can of worms. But what was strange was he bought me a very expensive painting off the wall. So when I was done playing, this um, woman comes over and she says, he left this for you, or he bought this for you. And the painting, the name of the painting was How Deep Is Your Love? So whoever the indie artist is, if you stumble upon this, you're out there because it was an Indianapolis painting. Mm -hmm. I believe I have the artist tag still. It was called How Deep Is Your Love? So I wrote a song about him called How Deep Is Your Love? And I still have, it's hanging up in the house. But I remember I drove around, I think, for like an hour or something afterwards, looking in the alleys and stuff for him. I checked the news for probably a week Oh, wow. And it, like, straight up haunted me, man. Wow. Um, so it came back around. I played there, I don't know, months or months later. And I was I started talking to somebody. I'm like, hey, you remember that? You know, were you here that night? They're like, I remember that. I said, has he ever come back in? Did he make it? And she goes, yeah, he bought somebody else a painting. <laughs> I was like, yes. <laughs> so, I mean, he's, the guy's spreading joy through buying some paintings. I just hope he, he figured out whatever is eating him so bad. But yeah. That was the first thing he said to me that was so, it's so loud. He goes, will you play a song for me? And it was so aggressive. So that's how the song starts. He says, will you play a song for me? One that I know the words so I can sing along and feel everything I deserve. You know? Wow. <laughs> it's hard to play it. It's tuned down uh, two whole steps. I want it, I oh, want wow. it to where the strings almost sound like they're falling off the guitar because it gives you that such like a heavy, heavy feeling. That's how I felt from him. Was this that? So when when you played, uh, when we played together that one night, um, I remember one of the as we were getting closer to the end of the uh, of the evening, you were asking people what did they want to hear from you, mm-hmm. and you like gave them a range of difficulty. Oh, and, sure. And 
and someone sh- sh- shouted out, most difficult. Yeah, I said uh, green light, yellow light, red light. Yeah. And everybody that read, I'm yeah. like, so with red, it's cool. But it becomes, it, the audience has to then play their part, and their part has to be dead silent for mm-hmm. that. Um, it's the only way I'll play that one. I won't play that stuff in a room with people talking. Like, not those. That song's neat, man. That's the only one where I heard it, uh, legit heard it in a dream and caught it. So when I woke up, I as fast as I could, I got to the guitar. Problem was, I hit the strings. I'm like, none of these chords are working. So I started tuning everything to fit where it should be from what I heard. I mean, you got about like a minute before it's gone. It's yeah. just like vapor after that. And the coolest part of that song, I think it's cool, when you put the capo on, the capo's on five strings. So I was cutting capos off with the chop saw for a while mm-hmm. to get that sixth string yeah. <clears throat> open. But the capo's on the second string, so then you actually, on the low E string, you have to reach over the capo on a couple things, which is pretty wild. But that's just how that one turned out. And uh, the lyrics is the first time I wrote a song that it didn't have to make sense. Mm-hmm. I love the lyrics of that song. Um, what is the name of that song? It's called Astonished. Okay. Yeah, and I love the way it starts because it goes back to the thing of about people being asleep. Cause it says, open up your eyes, you know? Mm-hmm. And it's a lot of my songs start like that. They start with a call out. You know, people in a room prob- or in an audience, a bar or whatever, just hear a guy playing. Mm-hmm. I'm talking directly to them. Yeah. It's up to them if they want to hear it. Do you ever find if you're, like, when you think about the music that you play, because uh, this is something that I think about, um, I think that, like, my music probably tends to le- lend itself more towards, like, a coffee shop vibe mm-hmm. than a bar vibe. Do you feel that way about your, or do you feel comfortable playing anywhere? Um, oh, in all honesty, I feel comfortable playing anywhere. My my vibe is... Um... Man, it's it's very, like, I love, the thing I love most is having a personal, um, like putting on a personal show for somebody. Yeah. Maybe two or three people. And either in my house, somewhere where I know I have people's attention, I don't have to ask for it. It's just there. Mm-hmm. And if it's not there, you'll get them within 30 seconds. And then all of a sudden it is there. You feel the room like the air changes. Mm-hmm. I and mean, everybody's kind of zones in to this, you know, this focus kind of thing. I love that. The coffee shops are great. I mean, that's definitely a place where it's like that. But another place that can be like that is on the back of a tailgate in the country, you know? Mm, yeah. It can be, uh, I met a friend of mine in Ohio, and uh, he'd never heard me play live. And we got in the front seat of my truck. I got in the pasture seat, so the neck of the guitar was, like, in his yeah. face. <laughs> and I play him, like, five songs or so. Oh, wow. And uh, he's like, this is so crazy. I'm like, well, yeah, man. But it has good, you actually have good acoustics in cars. It's weird. Really? Yeah, it's well, like I, know you're... I mean, it bounces off the windshield, but it's yeah, you got a little dead space, but it's got enough room for a little bit of reverb, you know. And I never <clears> would have <throat> thought of that. Uh, there's a lot of, I think it was um, Hobo Johnson. I think did his album in a '94 Corolla. I recorded, <laughs> really? yeah, I, really? I recorded a lot in a '94 Corolla. It was the same color too. We both had white '94 Corollas. Really? I used to drive when I was in Colorado. I would drive and get to, like the mountain range. Just mm-hmm. it was the first time I was seeing it. So I'd drive out there and uh, set the mics up on the dashboard or whatever I had to do and track away. Do you get inspiration from being out in the mountains and seeing that? or Because, um, I, I mean, I've spent, I haven't spent a whole lot of time out in Colorado. I mean, I spent a summer out there, out in Colorado, actually Woodland Park, mm-hmm. um, which is right next door to, to Manitou Springs, which is next to Colorado <laughs> Springs. Um, but I, I find just... The, the view there. It was so, stunning. Yeah. Yes. yes. <laughs> stunning. I- inspirational. Sure. Um, I think it leaves, like you cannot go out there and not feel inspired. That's crazy. Yeah. So I think it just leaves something in you and then all of a sudden it's like, man, I'm going to write about this or something. I've never written, no, I take it back. I have written a song about a mountain, uh, but it wasn't those specifically. Mm-hmm. But, yeah. But we have, we're actually even past I think where we normally would go. Oh, I have so much more to tell you. Well, that's oh. why we have the podcast with you coming up. <laughs> but before we get to that, could you play us out with? Uh, but and actually, before you play us out, while you're getting that ready, I want to talk about my other sponsor, which is the Engine Room Recording Company. 
which is where I do this wonderful podcast and live stream that I have been doing now since September. And the Engine Room Recording Company is located in Broad Ripple Village, just north of downtown Indianapolis, and they specialize in making your projects go. Podcasters, bands, audiobookers, rappers, singers, songwriters, and everyone in between, the Engine Room Recording Company has the engineers, the equipment, and the environment to fuel your projects. Check out Broad Ripple's Recording Studio by visiting for more information on their services, artists they've recorded, and gear they have at EngineRoomRecordingCompany.com. And be sure to check out their Instagram page by searching at Engine Room Recording Company. And so I'm going to have Paul Holland, who's been my guest on this week's, on this month's live stream. He's going to play us out with, uh, with another song. Which one is this going to be, Paul? So I haven't played this in a long time, but it's called Counting Miracles. <clears throat> Did I come across Counting Miracles? Counting Miracles. What's this one about? Um, I remember driving one time in, through Iowa in the real early morning. And uh, I remember just looking out. I think it was like five or six hour drive. And I remember looking just super early. But I looked out and it was just fog everywhere over the fields and everything. It's just, uh, just an image that stuck with me. I was like, mm -hmm. man, it's a miracle to even be able to see this. You know, not everybody gets that honor. And... It's a reminder, like to me, that something small to one person might be a miracle to somebody else. Mm -hmm. It's also a motivator for me as well. That's a good motivation to have. Let's see if I can pull it off. Okay. <clears throat> Get up, get out of bed We'll show yourself to work It surely beats some things It beats standing on the curb This world is amazing When you get your shoes out on the street The sun can be unbearable But that's reason to cuss the heat I've been counting miracles but even now before you were alive I've been brought down to my knees baby in the morning light get up get out of bed I'll be grateful for your time It surely beats some things It beats Just wishing you could rewind This world is a carousel That wants to take you for a spin Your hair will get messed up But that's a reason to cuss the wind I've been counting miracles, but even now before you were alive I've been brought down to my knees, baby, in the dead of night Well, no matter where you're going, feel as deep as the ocean while you're here Left your head off in the moonlight With faces you haven't seen in years Don't let the days all become runaways Light up every room like a chandelier Well, out on the rooftops and watch those tiny lights disappear Yeah, it'll take your breath away Get up, get out of bed, and 
and just thank your lucky stars It surely beats some things it beats having a broken heart This world is a compass so just do what you think is right The sun will set early but that's a reason to cuss the night I've been counting miracles, baby, now before you were alive I've been brought down to my knees, baby, in the morning light I've been counting miracles, baby, now before you were alive Been brought down to my knees, baby, in the dead of night. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, I, man. Yeah, you're welcome. I count it as a blessing that I had Paul Holland <laughs> on the live stream. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this has been Paul Holland. Thank you for being on Thanks the so program. Thanks so much for letting me come on. Um, stay tuned. We will be having Paul Holland stick around for a podcast. Uh, so we'll get more of his stories, hopefully, because they are quite entertaining. Uh, I hope you got like six more hours, man. <laughs> I got plenty. Of you got to be anywhere tomorrow. No. <laughs> uh, so, for Josh Gillespie, this has been Paul. Or yes, my I'm Josh Gillespie. This has been Paul Holland. Thank you for tuning into Voices of Indy, the live stream. Uh, tune in. Uh, be on the lookout in the next week or two uh, for the full podcast with Paul, and um, we'll see you guys again next time.